My name's Holly. I'm head of film at the Austin Film Society. Welcome to the AFS Cinema. Welcome to our many members who are here. Welcome to our friends at the Austin Asian American Film Festival who are frequently in this theater. Welcome, guys, and to the Austin Film Festival members who are here tonight. We're so happy to have you all in the house. Um, this is a, a great way to start your week, Monday with The Farewell, a film that we have been waiting for ever since it premiered at the Sundance Film Festival this year. And we have something really exciting in store for you tonight because Lulu Wang, the writer and director of the film, is here in Austin and she will be here um, to present the film after for the Q&A. So um, she's not here right now, but she will be here after we show the movie. Um, so we're so thrilled that she's here in Austin and is going to share um, with us. So if if you'll stay in your seats after the credits roll, um, we'll bring Lulu up here to answer your questions and talk with us about the making of her wonderful film. Thank you so much to A24 for working with us on this screening tonight. And The Farewell opens in Austin this Friday. And I think, um, I'm so glad to see you all here tonight for this preview, but we've got to spread the word. This is, I think, going to make history for a film um, by a Chinese American filmmaker and um, for this kind of independent film to get out in the world and uh, make a big impact. So let's spread the word after we see it tonight. So I'll see you all here for the Q&A. Um, just stay in your seats after the credits roll. Please take a minute to silence your cell phones. And thanks again for coming out to the AFS Cinema on Monday. Enjoy the farewell. Please join me in welcoming the writer director of the farewell, Lulu Wang. Thanks so much for joining us in Austin. Um, it's really a pleasure to have you here, and we'll get some questions from the house. She's gonna, she's been nonstop q and I think, throughout the country. <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep it fresh, don't worry. <laughs> we'll try, we'll try. Um, so you made, you've added uh, a film to the family canon. I think there are, you know, people don't realize how cinematic families can be, and you found new ways to exploit that. So I just wanted to hear from you about family films and sort of um, how, how do you go about building this um, dynamic and making every character so memorable? And what's important about, about a family film? Um, you know, I think for me it was really about uh, how nothing gets resolved in the family, yeah. you know? But like things are ridiculous and funny um, and sad all at the same time and it's just this like mix of emotions and, it, and there's no resolution, and the next day you get up and do it all over again. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, that was really what drew me to telling the story, was that so, when I was going through the experience, I was like, this is so typical of my family, and I don't feel like I've ever seen that on screen, and where, you know, I felt like it's, it's both American and Chinese, and trying to go, and trying to figure out, is it American, is it Chinese, is it you, is it me, am I crazy, are you crazy? Um, Am, am I, can I laugh here? Is it inappropriate? My uncle's crying, but it's kind of funny. Um, anyone else think it's funny? No, no, just me? Okay, I'm just a jerk then. You know, that's how I felt in real life when my uncle was crying and I was like, but, but my family didn't know that he gave me this long speech about, you know, not revealing the secret and I can't show my emotions and then he's up there crying. I'm like, ha! <laughs> but you know, my family, they're just like, you know, awkward, and so, like, I wanted to capture all of that, and I wanted to kind of put that on screen and sort of not explicitly be funny or sad, but just sort of present it and see, you know, how different audience members react. And and it's negotiating also how much is culture, and, and like you said, and how much is this specific family, and did you find yourself sort of pulled between those two poles as, as a director and as, as somebody writing about your own experience? Yeah, definitely, because, you know, I, I didn't set out specifically to make an Asian or Asian American film, because when I look at my family, I don't go, I don't look at them as an Asian or Asian American family. Right. I just go, that's my grandma, that's my mom, you know. This is just my family. And so, so often I'm negotiating between, you know, the two worlds that I inhabit. One is my family and my personal, you know, my childhood, my, the, their culture. Um, and then the other one is who I am in the world as a, 
you know, adult, as a, as a filmmaker with friends and in American culture. And, um, and I think everyone has that, right? Like who they are with their family, who, like the people who've like changed your diapers and like seen grow up and then who you are in the world. And so I have that same sort of divide, but mine just happens to be colored by culture mm -hmm. as well on both sides. And so, but, but I don't know like how much of it is culture and how much of it is just because I'm a child and they'll always see me that way and right. trying to figure that out. Well, I think it's so wonderful about the film is that you draw us into not just a culture that some of us might not be familiar with, but a culture of a family. And it's very clear that it is that family specific dynamic. Um, how, how much is um, taken from the characters that are your family and, and how, how much is, is new and invented? Uh, I would say most of it is pretty much true to my real family because, um, you know, I didn't want, it's not about the facts, like, right. for example, I, like, people always ask, like, what's real and what was made mm -hmm. up, little things, like my uh, little Nai Nai, mm -hmm. um, who plays herself, by the way, um, that's my real great aunt, she's not an actor, and uh, that's her real dog, Ellen. <laughs> Um, and Ellen does not sing for anybody else, so I, I had to cast Little Nine Nine because otherwise <laughs> Ellen wouldn't have sang if it was an actress. Um, but uh, but yeah, but you know, sh her she came to the New York premiere with her husband, uh, Little Grandpa, and <laughs> and uh, he 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 very much is with her, and they're together. He's he's not working in Shenzhen somewhere. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that was made up because right. I was like, I'm sorry, little grandpa, there's too many characters <laughs> in the movie. People are already going to be confused. And so I, you get on in the movie and we made you go work in Shinden. And he's like, that's okay. okay. Um, so little things like that, you know, but it's like, it's unimportant, right? It's really yeah. about the, it's, but, but I kept, you know, the, the dynamics very um, real and I uh, tried to, just track each person's emotional journey and mm -hmm. you know where they fall on the spectrum of like east versus west. Mm -hmm. I think that's very accurate. Like all the things that my uncle's saying is are things that he very much believes um, that I may not necessarily agree with, but I wanted to make sure I was respecting him by portraying his perspective on the screen. Mm -hmm. the, the cast is just so incredible. Each role is so beautifully cast, and um, the performances are are you know the the heart of it. And um, that that scene at the end where Aquafina um, is saying goodbye to her grandmother and asking her whether she's okay, um, it's almost as if she's starting to believe the lie a bit, asking her if she's okay. Is that what's happening there, or can you talk a little bit about that? Her having to believe that or hold on to it because otherwise, how could she leave? Yeah, I think it's a little bit like, you know, with illness, um, if you don't see it, if the person doesn't have symptoms, mm -hmm. then are they okay? You know, are they dying? Are we all dying? You know, <laughs> you kind of go get into this sort of thing where, um, yeah, so I guess it's a little bit that where she, 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 cause you know, her, her, uh, her aunt says, um, she looks fine, right? Just like a normal person. And so I think that, that, that's her kind of going, all right, is she normal? And how much longer do we have this normality? Yeah. Um, so I was not, I've never been to a Chinese wedding. I'm not familiar with Chinese wedding culture. How is this based on a real wedding? Um, and what is your experience going to Chinese weddings? And what did you bring to this incredible scene? <laughs> yeah, I wanted to, ca you know, make it a very immersive experience the way that it is for me in real life. Yeah. Uh, because it doesn't look like any other wedding, you know, that an American might go to. Um, and so I didn't want to explain it. I didn't want to go, well, you know, there's not gonna, there, no one's in a white dress and they're not walking down the aisle. This is not just the reception. This is actually the wedding because in Chinese culture they don't they're not Catholic, so they they don't have a whole walk down the aisle priest thing. So it really is just the banquet, and a lot of times it's uh, it's I mean always at least in northern China it takes place during the day because there's a lot of elderly people who are older right. and uh, they don't want to eat that much food during the day. Um, there's also people at the end. I didn't put this in the movie, but like we went to I took my production designer, my DP to the actual space the weekend, like two weeks before, or a weekend before we were scouting. And we were like looking at um, the decor and the food for them to get some inspiration. And we, we got there and 
they were just so confused and and, and they were like this is the wedding i was like this is it we like just walked in people were in t-shirts some people were in gowns some people were in t-shirts and flip-flops you know and then um at the end um there was so much food left because it's also part of chinese culture so you have to over order otherwise you're cheap and people go home starving <laughs> so you have to order too much food and then everyone gets plastic bags and they put all the food in plastic bags and they walk home with food that's like their wedding you know Give like back. piece of cake that you took home, yeah. yeah. No, they, they, they take like, you know, a, a whole thing of like tofu and it's like <laughs> dumping it in a plastic bag. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, because there's no waste. They don't yeah. want to waste the food. So so yeah, so I very much stuck um, to how it is, I think the spirit of it, you know, of just like you, you're immersed in it and you're, you're not quite sure like, is there going to be more? Yeah. What is this? You know, like, is it just speeches? Is there what's going to happen next? Um, and I wanted the audience to have that same sort of some talent show thing happening with yeah. karaoke. <laughs> exactly. It's so so great. And actually, you do see the food on the at the end of the wedding. There's still lots of food on the table in the scene. It's wonderful, and it's so much food and and so much of that family culture and eating in the film too. Um, and uh, clearly, that is important to you as well, the food that was represented. Yeah, but you know, for me, the food, it's like, I can't make this movie without food. There's just, no, I have to like intentionally avoid it, yeah. right? Um, and in the beginning when I was writing the script, I had a note from one of the producers saying that there was like too much food. Um, he was like, there's just so much eating, it's really repetitive. I was like, I know, exactly. <laughs> and he's like, no, that was like a note. Like, we think there's too much. Like, it's repetitive for the audience, you should change it. And I was like, but to what? He's like, I don't know, like, we're in China, let's take advantage of the location, maybe they go for a walk in the park. I'm like, why would they go for a walk in the park? <laughs> like, grandma's dying and there's a wedding to plan, like, who's gonna, 12 people gonna go walk around a park? Like, can't write that, never happened. Um, and so we went on a location scout and I brought the producers and they got there by the, by the end of the trip, like the third day, we were there for three days, and by the end of it, they were just like, oh my God, I can't eat anymore. I get it, I get the script. Yes, it has to be, like as many meals as you have in there, it has to be that way. Um, and so I was aware there was a lot of eating, a lot of round tables, and I wanted to make sure that it didn't feel repetitive, that every food meal had its own purpose, um, and that they were shot very differently. And I also didn't want to use food um, as like food porn. You know, there's a lot of films, about, Asian films specifically, about food where it's specifically about the glamour of the food and it all looks delicious and there's like close-up shots of food. And I wanted to not do that because in this, um, even though, you know, people see the film and they are hungry and there is a lot of food, um, I also wanted to use it as a, a visual representation of the tension of the conflict because one of the, you know, ways that Nai Nai expresses love, particularly if she thinks it's a celebration, is by giving everyone food. And the way that you um, express love back is by eating her food. Um, but if you're grieving, you lose your appetite. And so this escalating tension of Nai Nai being like, eat, 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 and you know, her feeling, or Billy, but also the whole family feeling like they have to eat, 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 but not wanting to. And that continues to escalate as like, there's more and more food, especially at the wedding. Such an amazing way to build that, and and just the moment where she feeds her granddaughter that meat pie, and she just takes this little bite like a baby bird, and <laughs> her being forced to, to eat by grandma. Um, so we've got some time for questions, and we'd love to hear everybody's thoughts. So I have one right in the center, right here. Yes, ma'am. What's the significance of the finch bird? Uh, okay, so talk a little bit about the the little bird that that shows up. Yeah, um, the bird, I, I put the bird in because, you know, during this period in my life, there were a lot of coincidences, um, big and small, and I think that, you know, with there's signs, for me, I believe that there's signs in the universe, um, but I really think it's all about perspective, because there, there's sometimes there's these weird coincidences, you're like, what does it mean? And, you know, and I, I came to realize, like, it means what you want it to mean. Like, there's no clear answer, there's no... Um, definitive answer to tell you that, that this means something. So depending on what you believe, depending on um, if you're a spiritual person, you can find meaning in that thing and you can interpret it and, and do something with that. 
But if you don't believe in anything, um, you can look at that bird and just go, okay, it's a bird. You know, and so it was my, I guess it was my way of just kind of showing that, um, to, to add magic into the movie for people who believe in magic, and to add just a bird for people who don't. <laughs> yes, right here. Knowing that you have some scenes in the movie that are like out and out explanatory, like when they're at the round table and they're talking about sending Bao to America for college, or this is the difference of like the East versus the West. And then you have some scenes that are more like purely immersive, like the wedding scene. How did you like navigate which scenes to make a little more like culturally didactic, excuse me, and which scenes to make like more of an immersive experience for the audience? Okay, so talking a little bit about um, the scenes that maybe explained the dynamic of having a, a family that's across multiple um, continents and cultures, and then also the more immersive, t talking about the culture from an immersive perspective. Yeah, I mean, I would say some of the like um, didacticness comes from when I found that my family members were being didactic. You know that it's that it, it's not me explaining it to an audience. It's it's literally you know her family members explaining it to her because they think she's the idiot American and so in a way like you know some people might watch that and go well you know is this being explained to me and it's very condescending that's not my voice yeah. you know that's my, that's at my uncle actually said those things you know <laughs> like I've been at that dinner table where people have those conversations and so um you know, I wanted the audience to get affected by it, certainly, but like, you know, for me, sometimes it feels very patronizing, you know, because you're talking to me as like the dumb Westerner, and this is the East and this is the West, and that's kind of the character. Right, know? right, and her saying, I know, I know, it's like, yeah, I've lived in this culture too. I, I, I actually do know to some degree, and yeah. Um, okay, I saw, yes, right here in the end, you're, you were next, yes. So the question is, from when you were writing, was the intent that Nai Nai um, knew that it was a lie, um, that somehow she knew the truth? Um, I did not, because I don't know that Nai Nai knows that it's a lie, you know? I don't know what she knows, right? So um, I, I, I just kind of... I just kind of reflected on real experiences without, I didn't want to comment one way or the other because, you know, to this day, I don't know if she really, really knows uh, or not. I don't think she does. I've been told that she does not know still, um, but I, I don't know if that's the truth and I don't know if I'll ever fully know. Um, so I, I'm, I'm sure that when Zhao was playing her, she had different things in mind. Um, but that, you know, I think that's a question for, that would be for Zhao. And maybe in some ways, Zhao Shujin, who plays Nai Nai, uh, spent some time with my real grandmother. And in some ways, maybe she knows more than I even know, right? There, there are so many cultural or generational gaps and um, things that I'll never know about my grandma. Um, and I have to accept that, you know? And that's why I cast people to, and I was very open about them spending time with the people in real life because I wanted them to have a connection and I, in some ways I wanted them to own that character in a way that I'll never really fully own. Has your grandmother seen the film? No. <laughs> then, she, then she would know. <laughs> we can't show it to her. <laughs> Over here, yes. What was your family's reaction when you told them you were making a movie about them? Um, well, I did This American Life first, so that was their first like introduction into me writing a story. And um, the producer, Neil Drumming, came to my parents' house, and I was there, and we spent a couple days and interviewed them. And um, they seemed pretty open about, about it. Uh, but then when I said, you know, I'm writing a script, my dad was like, why? Like, why does anyone care? Is this interesting to them, you know? Um, and he read the script and he was like, yeah. He, but he watches like Die Hard and like, you know, these big action movies. So he thought I would dramatize it in some ways. And I, but I, and he saw that I didn't. He was like, you know, I don't know why this is interesting to anybody. Um, yeah. 
Well. <laughs> it's interesting to a lot of people <laughs> over here, sir. I really love the clip at the end where it explained that Nai Nai was still alive six years after her diagnosis. Was it always your intent to have that in there, or did you add it to kind of put a happy note right at the end of it? Yeah, talk about the choice to show your real grandmother at the end. Yeah, I did not write it always with with that in mind. In fact, I, I didn't want to put that in. Um, but then I thought a lot about because you know I didn't want to have the real ending be that because I don't. The movie to me is not about whether she lives or dies. It's not a plot driven movie that's like you know we're gonna save this woman and in the end we do right. It's um it's it's about something deeper about spiritual connection um, with the ones that you love even if you are separated by an ocean. Um, but, you know, I decided to put that in because in thinking, of, not for a happy ending, not to, you know, intentionally create like a, a false happy ending, um, but more because whenever I think about the lie itself and whether it's right or wrong, I can't think about it without the knowledge that my grandmother outlived her prognosis. And so that, that fact is always going to influence how I feel about the lie, mm -hmm. even though on a fundamental level I still disagree with this idea of lying to somebody. But then it's the, the minute that I think about that, I'm like, well, but she did like live this long, you know, and what if we had told her, you know, and I'll, we'll never know, like we can't go back in time and, and see. And so I think that's kind of part of the discussion about um, this decision from the family. And, and I have it with my family all the time because of course now everybody in the family is like, see, we did the right thing. <laughs> and I'm like, you, 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 that, you don't have evidence of that. And they're like, yes we do, she lived longer. Like, yeah, but like if I was um, getting up every morning at 6 a.m. facing the sunrise and hopping up and down on my left foot every single day, I could say that's the thing that caused her to live this long, right? Like you, you don't, you can't. That's that's not how science works. You can't deduce that this is the thing. But but my entire family is like convinced, and and my uncle of course thinks it's his probiotics. He's like, you know, we can't we can't stop these probiotics now because you know we go with cheaper ones, and then if she dies, it's your fault. <laughs> Okay, we have time. we're not gonna have time to get to everybody, but I'll do my best. There's the hand in the back, black shirt. Yes, you. My question is like twofold. How do you go back to China since Ben since you told Ben the lie and second, what's your cousin and his Japanese wife doing now? Have you <laughs> have you returned to China since and what is your cousin and his Japanese wife doing now? <laughs> Um, they are still married. They live in Japan. So they really are married. They like really this, are married, This yeah. counted as an official, yeah. Yeah, he's liked all my posts on Facebook about the movie, so <laughs> but we haven't talked about it. I'm, I'm excited to see it, because we have a Japanese release, so. Um, I have been back to, since telling the lie, because I went back to shoot the movie, and my grandma was on set. Um, but I told the crew, do not tell her what it's about. <laughs> so, she was on set and she didn't know what it was about. And when we cast her sister, she was like, who are you gonna play in the movie? And little Nina was like, a grandma. She was like, me, grandma? She was like, no, not you, grandma, like a grandma. And then later, when she met the entire cast, she knew that, oh, like, you're actually playing yourself. I don't know, I, anyways, I don't know how, how she, what she thinks. But anyway, she met all the actors. So, she, so then she knew it was about her family. Um, and so she was like, well, what's it about? And I said, it's about our family going back to China for a reunion because my cousin gets married. <laughs> she's like, oh. So that's what she thinks it's a wedding comedy. <laughs> which it is. <laughs> You've had your hand up for a while, yes. I just would like to hear you speak on the difficulty of like really fully developing that many characters because I was impressed the whole film that I had a sense of everyone even though I knew almost none of their names, uh, you know, the entire family. So just like as both a writer and director, what's that challenge like and, and was that difficult? Yeah, talk about developing so many characters so well. Um, you've got a lot of characters and everybody has such a distinct, is so distinctly well written. And um, thank you. Well, I, I, I think, you know, the cast did a tremendous job of that, you know, um, themselves. And, um, 
And also, I, I thought of the whole family as a unit a lot, you know, because the film is so much about the individual versus the collective. And so even like my DP and I, we talked about the family unit as a single character. And, and so in a way, there's a chemistry between all of them that I was very familiar with because they're based on my own family. Um, but as a, as a whole family unit, they uh, are performing, right? They are performing joy. They're performing a wedding for the sake of Nai Nai. And so I made sure that throughout the movie, you know, I, we were seeing ways in which these different characters were performing their joy um, for the sake of, uh, of the matriarch. But, at, but I also made sure that throughout the film, I gave each person a moment where they dropped that performance. And we got to see, you know, the personal underneath. Yeah. Yes, sir, glasses. Um, so I saw your short film, Touch, watching The Farewell today, um, the music and the score in both of them are so heavily ingrained in the story. And even with Billy, like, knowing the piano and the opera, I just wanted to know, like, how much do you think about music when you're writing it, or, or pre-production, and then also like, when you're going into it, if, if at all? So talk about music and score are so critical to the story you're telling here, and is it something that you work with as you're writing and developing the film, um, and wh where does it come into your process? Um, yeah, I think about music a lot. I listen to soundtracks and all kinds of stuff. I was listening to the Leonard Cohen song a lot because he died around the time I was, uh, my grandma, I found out my grandma got sick and I was developing the script, so I always was listening to Leonard Cohen to me because he, he became very spiritual later in life his music sounds like and he sounds like the voice of God in a way <laughs> um, and so that's why there's the Leonard Cohen song in there but yeah you know I just um, I do I listen to a lot of music while I'm writing and to try to get a sense of tone and it does affect a lot the tone for example um, you know I was listening to like like all this um, very me melodramatic music uh, from old movies uh, like Godfather, I was listening to um, Italian opera, and in a way, I was inspired by like Greek tragedies and operas, and that the melodrama, the size of all of that, you know. And I thought, well, why can't that? That because that's the size of the emotions for the, this family member, especially for Billy. And so, wouldn't it be great if there was a moment of like an Italian opera song? Um, that represents, you know, the catharsis, right? As opposed to having like a plot device for catharsis that you use like music, or um, or having, you know, a moment that feels like out of a gangster movie, like there's slow motion walking um, <laughs> with this very dramatic music um, to, to 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 kind of represent how they come together for this lie. So yeah, music is definitely something that I think about from the beginning. Okay, last question. Um, we'll take uh, you in the back, yes. Get back to reality just for a moment. How is it possible, how do you manage to keep Nai Nai from seeing the movie that she does? <laughs> <without her>? <laughs> <laughs> how are you gonna keep her from seeing the movie that <laughs> she knows she's in in some way? Oh, well, sh I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, we have, um, <laughs> We, when I first told, I, I, when we did the radio show, I said, you know, one of the things that is going to happen is this is a national radio show, or global, really, This American Life. My parents were like, yeah, but you know, it's a radio show, it's in English, she's never going to listen to it. And then when, when I started doing the film, they were like, well, you know, you've written other films before, they've gone nowhere. So, <laughs> as long as they're paying you, like, just write the script, you know, we'll see what happens. And then, you know, we went to make the film. And, um, and, and I, I said, well, little Nai Nai will be around. I'm casting her in the movie, so as long as she's around, she'll help protect the lie. Um, and she, as long as she's comfortable with it, right? I felt like it wasn't my responsibility. Mm -hmm. Then we got into Sundance, and it was like, well, it's an American festival, so, <laughs> you know. But now, you know, it's out in the world, and we got Chinese distribution, and it's gonna be <laughs> in China next year. That's amazing. It's very difficult to get Chinese distribution for an American yeah. film. Yeah, and we're a co-production, mm -hmm. so um, it was really hard to get that co-production status too. Uh, so you know, so we'll see. But it's I feel like it's out of my hands because I've warned everyone from the beginning, and everyone <laughs> just kept hunting the problem down the road. Um, but um, you know, but part of us, she's getting older. She's 86, and so you know, I think all of us kind of feel 
a sense of responsibility now to tell her and to let her know that the whole world knows who she is. <laughs> you know, and knows about her situation um, and that she herself doesn't know. And little Nai Nai said to me, because she was in New York last Monday for the premiere, and I said, you know, we have Chinese distribution, it's gonna be out, there's gonna be trailers, like, even if she's in the apartment, it might come on TV, her friends, somebody might send it, I don't know, like, it's gonna be much harder to keep it from her. And little Nai Nai's like, yeah, you know, I've been thinking about this a lot, and I, I've decided, I think that, you know, what we should say is that movies are fictional. <laughs> I'm like, good luck to you. I don't know how that's gonna go, but that is amazing. Um, because this is the Austin Film Society, I have to ask you, you know, there's a lot of great great films that are, you know, feature lies. Do you have any favorites? Wait, featured? F uh, movies that have lies, or great lies in films. Oh, um, well, one of my favorites, is, who's a, the director is a huge inspiration, is Mike Lee's Secrets and Lies. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's awesome. Um, I think force majeure is a big expression, and there's a lie in that too, right? I mean, it, he's lying to himself without any spoilers for those who haven't right. seen the movie. Yeah. But it's a man about a man who's lying to himself. Yeah. Thank you for for yeah. We got got to have movies in our back pocket to watch after seeing this great one. Thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you. Thank you. And in theater this Friday in Austin. So Please spread the word. Yeah. yeah. Thanks so much. Really.